right. Thanks All right. a lot for the introduction. And thanks, of course, for the invitation. Uh, it's a great pleasure to um, be able to uh, yeah, give a bit of an introduction to what I'm thinking about in the direction of yeah, scaling superconducting systems. Um, so Victor has rightfully <laughs> remarked on the boringness of my first Okay, now I'm muted again. Um, yeah, Victor has already remarked on the boringness of my first slide. I felt it was somewhat appropriate um, because, well, there is at the moment, my own lab is very much under construction. So normally I like putting some interesting uh, visualization of what I've been doing recently, but that has, uh, yeah, that has been not so much, to be honest. Um, so, what, I'm what I'll be talking about is um, some um, a little bit of an overview of what's going on in the field of saying like how to improve um, connectivity and modularity in superconducting circuits, in particular using parametric interactions, uh, engineered parametric interactions uh, that make use of Josephson junctions um, to make that happen. This is interesting to me. This is a part of a larger focus. I'm just going to sneak some advertisement in here. Uh, a larger focus that we're uh, that's ongoing at Illinois. We've been recently have started a uh, an NSF a QLCI effort um, for hybrid quantum architectures and networks. And the whole effort of this um, of this uh, of this institute will be going toward um, achieving distributed quantum processing. So basically, yeah, on a hardware level, that's all about connecting qubits together in different interesting ways and potentially creating large hybrid sort of systems. Um, yeah, this is a very much, so this is a uh, artistic uh, visualization of the future, if you see here. The reality looks a bit more dire. <laughs> so this is currently the lab, the view of the lab that I hopefully will be, uh, or one of the labs I'll hopefully be using to um, start doing experimental research in these directions that I'm gonna be talking about. But yeah, as I said, there is not much happening in terms of actual hands-on science in the moment. So this talk will be mostly like an overview of what's going on in the field and some of the recent results, including some of my own. So um, what do we wanna do? Um, of course, the, the theme I mentioned is connecting qubits or similar things, um, or qubit-like objects. The overarching theme is, of course, making bigger, better, bottom-up engineered quantum systems in some way uh, that you might use as simulators, computers, what have you. Um, and the question that I'm particularly interested in is kind of what are maybe interesting, useful ways to make these different entities talk to each other, in particular in scenarios where you wouldn't expect them to talk to each other, and um, exploring what are kind of the limits to connectivity that we can actually achieve in the lab. So a few things, maybe to know, so what are some of the aspects you could think of wanting from connecting your qubits? Now, one of them is fairly obvious. You want your, your qubit interactions to yield high fidelity gates. That does maybe not need much stressing. Then further, what we're interested in is making very highly connected things. Um, ideally, you might want to think that um, maybe you want to have everything fully connected, so all to all connectivity. Um, it's been shown that that can lower acceptable error rates when you think of going towards fault tolerance, for example. Um, but of course, it also might for analog quantum simulation or things like that, it might help you uh, to implement whatever you want to do in a more direct fashion, depending on the thing you have in mind. So then come a few more aspects that are maybe more <laughs> for the experimentalists. Of course, uh, what we like is modularity, um, especially in the current era where we're still very much tinkering with individual elements. Um, and it can be a huge plus there if you have say the ability to replace or debug individual elements, kind of to swap them out because that gives us an opportunity to kind of study the behavior of our system in a much better fashion, I believe. And finally, um, yeah, we could maybe call that compatibility. Um, it might be very nice to have the ability to interface different kinds of systems with each other. And so often we talk about qubits. For me, that's a bit sometimes of a, of a stand-in word for all sorts of things. Like one thing you can call, uh, think about is, for instance, bosonic codes. So it's uh, uh, encoded in microwave cavities. 
It's something I've been working on a little bit in the past at Yale. Um, but you can also think of connecting completely different things. So one example might be controlled noise sources to study um, to study your noise models or to study open system dynamics. Um, or you can think of completely different things, for instance, mechanical systems, spins, anything that talks to microwaves in the end, in our case. So, <clears throat> as I mentioned, um, well, we're, we're talking about superconducting circuits, and there, of course, there's some limitations to all of these things, um, if you think from first principles, um, because well, the connectivity is typically or most often set in some way by geometry, of course, right? So the physical interaction that we have in circuits is um, we have electromagnetic modes and they interact in some way. And this interaction is typically governed by basically where their electromagnetic fields overlap with each other. And together with Josephson junctions being present in these devices that gives rise to all of the nonlinear couplings that we're interested in. Um, and it's exactly that that has been dominated a lot of the, the most um, yeah, impressive efforts, I think. Um, you can see that kind of that way of coupling and basically the chip geometries that we see in some of the most advanced um, experiments. So this is on the left, what you see, for instance, the connectivity uh, in one of the most recent IBM efforts in their Falcon chip. Right, and you see here, yeah, this is really these black lines denote what qubits talk directly to each other. So it's very much like focused on neighbors. So you can see, and the same thing is true, of course, for other labs as well. So on the right side, this is uh, the, the Google Sycamore chip, um, where you also have this this, this kind of grid light grid like um, interaction pattern between the individual qubits. So again, very much nearest neighbors. Um, and these layouts are, are basically just a, the result of a compromise between what kind of fidelity can you achieve by what, how do you let your electromagnetic fields distribute across the chip and what you actually want to do in your experiment. So now this is that's kind of sort of the premise of um, what I want to go over today. So I'm going to start by reviewing a little bit of what are um, the exact what are the coupling schemes in uh, some of the most advanced experiments that we have in superconducting quantum circuits. Um, then I'm going to move on and talk a little bit about tunable or engineerable interactions. And we're going to be using drives for that. And with these tunable interactions, we're going to explore a little bit of how can we go a little bit further in terms of connectivity and flexibility. Say one example will be um, yeah, how to route um, coherent interactions between different um, qubits and cavities. <clears throat> then. I'm going to talk a little bit about how going how to go even more flexible. Um, we can do that by not um, by not making use of direct hybridization, but instead of talking um, mediating interactions with propagating photons. And finally, based on that, I'm going to um, end with talking about some prospects in that direction, um, namely how you could use a certain kind of engineered couplings like non-reciprocal interactions to um, build routers for propagating photons and maybe um, think about um, stabilization of quantum states in open systems. All right, let's start with the first one. All right, so the typical qubit-qubit um, coupling in circuit QED um, um, is given by the James Cummings interaction. Right, so this is what it typically boils down to when we uh, have qubits talk to each other. And so this is the scenario when we have two qubits um, have some sort of dipole interaction with each other. <clears throat> um, and the nonlinearity non in these qubits allows us to basically see these, um, see yeah, this coherent splitting um, in, their, in, their, in, their, uh, in their state, so giving rise to this plus and minus state. And this is kind of the natural scenario that enables basically swap interactions between the two qubits. And if you're talking about, you can also go to a farther tuned regime, that's what we call typically the dispersive regime. There you have the scenario where the transition frequencies um, between the, of the two qubits depend on the state of the other qubit. So in other words, this is a, a, this is a natural um, conditional precession or controlled C kind of um, interaction that you have between your qubits. The way you can realize that on chip is uh, in multiple ways. Um, one of the really recognized ways is, for instance, the quantum bus 
We basically have the electric fields or the electric you know, dipoles, if you want, of your superconducting qubits interact with the electromagnetic fields of, um, reson of distributed resonators. And these fields then can um, mediate the, um, this interaction between the two qubits. And then the two qubits basically can, um, uh, can couple in this, in this resonant James Cummings form, if you like. <clears throat> Um, you don't need this bus necessarily. Um, you can also couple them straight straight to each other. This is kind of um, a chip from uh, from the UCSB group from you, uh, from a few years back, where now basically you have these the, the fields, the electromagnetic fields of the qubits, basically uh, directly couple and give rise to the same kind of interaction. So somewhere in between this swap-like and this um, control C-like um, interaction. Um, yeah, and it's relatively straightforward to see, of course, how to implement gates with that because the exact, like say, the regime you're sitting in. So that could be if you're in this in this kind of um, swap regime, or if you're, um, or if you're in a regime where you have controlled precession, depends entirely on the on the frequency difference um, between the qubits, and this is tunable. So that means by tuning the frequency of the different qubits, um, you can basically control the conditional evolution and therefore implement your, your gates between the different qubits. So what's a bit of a challenge that's also been recognized um, already since a while, of course, is um, that you have in this scenario, you have um, always on interactions. So this, there's literally at any time the qubits feel each other in some way, uh, some way. So you have to be relatively clever to push this into a really high into a really high gate fidelity regime. So a lot of work has been done on that in the recent years. Um, I just want to show a couple of examples of how you can what you can do to get to to really good fidelities there. Um, one is, for example, the the cross resonance gate that's been pioneered by IBM. So there you basically give up on this idea of frequency tuning your qubits. So you, treat them as static. So you have basically the static ZZ interaction between your qubits. But by driving in a particular way, so in particular what you do is you drive uh, on, on one qubit at the frequency of the other. And it turns out, if you look careful into that, this gives now rise instead of a controlled CZ and a static CZ interaction that gives now a controlled rotation on um, this qubit. So this one would be the control and this one would be the target here. And that allows you to to do C not with very high, uh, with very good quality. Um, some other approaches, for instance, implementing tunable couplers. Um, this is uh, this is work from Lincoln Labs, uh, and I think this uh, this scheme is also employed in the recent Google chips, um, where you now use basically uh, a qubit uh, instead of a of a bus resonator here. You use a qubit that couples to other qubits together. So this is this serves only the middle qubit only serves the role of a coupler. And now because you have these uh, yeah these these three coupling terms between the, the different qubits um, that allows you basically to fine tune the interaction between the actual two data qubits if you like. And that uh, allows yeah, very efficiently to um, to null residual interactions, for example. And this has also been key to realizing very precisely controllable swap interactions. Um, on the Sycamore chip. And yeah, these are just two of those. There's other, there's of course many other approaches of how to make um, high fidelity qubit gates and superconducting circuits. So, and yeah, it is, so it has been basically really this insight of saying like using not like this, this static interaction and just tuning frequencies, but also adding another layer of mediation and modulation of these, uh, of these interactions that have resulted in these, in these high fidelity gates that have now in the, in the last couple of years or so have been, have exceeded like 99% uh, in some of the, in some of the most advanced experiments. So, question is now, okay, can we take this idea of um, applying drives or modulating these interactions in some way for more complex interactions? In particular, things where you say like, can we have qubits interact not only with their neighbors, but with all sorts of other things? And this is what I want to, and in order to address that, uh, what I'm going to be talking a little bit is introduce basically how do you in situ enable or disable interactions by looking a little bit deeper in the Hamiltonian of the um, of the in the actual Hamiltonian of the system. 
So let's start again, like somewhat from the basics. So we can imagine that we have basically some network of electromagnetic modes. Right? So this is basically, it can be qubits, resonators, whatever. In the end of the day, it's electromagnetic modes. We have capacitors, inductors, Josephson junctions, and they all network together in some particular way. Now, the important um, thing here is to realize that the, that the Josephson junction, in this case, there's only one. This is it's located here in this A mode. Um, still, once you re-diagonalize uh, re um, the system and look at what, um, what all the eigenmodes are of the system, that basically all the eigenmodes participate a little bit in this junction, right? because they're coupled in the end of, at the end of the day. And what the Josephson junction does, it has a coupling Hamilton, it introduces a coupling Hamiltonian between all of these, all of these modes now, um, given by this term. And so we have the, the cosine, the cosine potential of the Josephson junction. And now in, in this cosine, the argument is basically the, yeah, the, the, the field operators of all of these different modes with prefactors that depend, of course, on how strong each of these eigenmodes um, participate in the Josephson junction. Now, this number, these numbers can be really, really small. They're generally small for transmons, for example, because they're not strongly unharmonic, um, but they're there. Now, if you look carefully, of course, that means uh, if these numbers are small, we can think of like looking, like doing some bookkeeping and walking through all the terms that are now pres actually present in this, um, in this interaction here. Right. And we can immediately see that this is, a, this is many, many terms that are really there, and we typically just choose to ignore them. Now, some of them we don't ignore. For instance, the one that I already mentioned, the always on ZZ interaction. Right? So we always have, an, have terms of the form A dagger A, B dagger B um, between, any of these, between any of these eigenmodes. And that's exactly this dispersive interaction that I mentioned before. But we have basically due to the cosine uh, term, we have all even order products that we can find in there are technically there. We just often ignore them. Right? One of them, you could even think uh, this would be a, a two photon swap process between any of these modes, but it just happens to be far of resonant typically when these modes have different frequencies. Right? So these terms oscillate very fast and we just throw them away normally in the static behavior of the circuit. And then there's, of course, also higher order. So we can think sixth order, eighth order, and they're just tiny. So we ignore them normally. Um, but they don't have to be tiny. And we can do something to make them show up. And this is uh, by applying drives to the system. Basically, you can think of that as using the Josephson junction as a nonlinear medium, if you like. <clears throat> so one way. Um, so what you can see, this is again the swap example here, right? If we can think of uh, now doing all the bookkeeping through the cosine Hamiltonian, and what we'll find is right that we can enable, for instance, or can find a, a, a four photon process that again looks like our swap interaction, but two of the photons now are coming from these drives, right? So they're basically they're pump photons, if you like. Right, so this is now this would now be a four photo, a four photon interaction. Right? It might be weak statically uh, because this pre, these prefactors can be very small. Um, but now, but we have the pump amplitude and phase showing up in this. Right? So that means we can amplify it by supplying more and more pump photons to the system. And of course, they can also be resonant because now we have to add up all the frequencies uh, in the right way from all of these uh, photon terms here. And that can get very close to resonance now, of course. So in other words, we can use pump photons right, to turn on these previously negligible interactions. And we can basically sift through the, through the cosine term and see like, okay, and, and try to find what we like and then design the, the pumps such that they enable what we've been looking for. So what I want to focus on um, in particular, what kind of interactions we're interested in. Okay, if we're interested in, in, in making gates between qubits, and so one of the things you can uh, look for are swap interactions. And we're trying to do that with four wave mixing terms, um, for example. So one of these four, so four wave mixing terms generally, okay, that's just a recap of the previous slide, essentially. It's like all terms of this kind of form, right? We have the product of four different um, field operators. Um, and again, as mentioned, like each photon operator 
um, can of course belong to uh, to one of the, the modes of the system, like only qubits, cavities, whatever, or pump photons. Right? And if you say, for instance, here we choose the C and D, and we try and let those be pump photons, right? Then these become basically classical numbers instead of operators because their fluctuations are negligible. <clears throat> and we enable this pump controlled swap Hamiltonian here. As long as we fulfill an energy, energy conservation um, that says that the difference between the pump photon free, uh, between the pump photon frequencies is the same as the frequency difference between the two modes between we want to create swap operations. And the nice thing about this is, in principle, um, that you that any kind of Joseph's injunction um, can provide us with this nonlinearity. Right? So even a single transmon is basically is a four wave mixer. Um, so it means, in other words, it's easy to build, and in most superconducting circuits, it comes kind of like pre-built in actually. The downside of this approach is that it can be a bit tricky to operate um, because uh, there's many potential frequency collisions in the system. Um, right? You can see, you can imagine, okay, if you really go through all possible terms here that you can find here, there's quite a lot of terms that are allowed and that create interactions. And often that's not the interaction you wanna, you wanna have. So you have to be a bit careful with that. Um, you can be a bit more clever about what kind of interactions um, you make by building dedicated, a bit more dedicated circuits um, that allows us, for instance, to go and do instead of three, uh, four wave mixing, three wave mixing. That is a that is a way of getting around this um, yeah this trickiness in operation because there's just much less terms that you can run into. Um, yeah, here's some example elements. This is one uh, so the the superconducting nonlinear asymmetric inductive element. Um, this can be operated as a three wave mixer. Uh, the original one, I would you now one of the original designs that I'm familiar with is this here. This is the Josephson ring modulator. Um, it's slightly different things, and what they have in common is basically that you um, that you make a loop. And you can make use of uh, the, yeah, the enforced flux quantization in this loop to change the boundary conditions and effectively the current phase relationship to these through these elements. Then allows you to make slightly different Hamiltonians than just the cosine of the of a single Josephs injunction, and that allows you then to tailor the three wave interaction that we're looking for. Uh, so this this looks then like this, a little less complicated. And here in this case, for instance, a, a swap Hamiltonian that you can think of is then this term, where now you basically have now to make an interaction between A and B, um, you just need to supply one photon from a pump that overcomes the energy difference between those. Is of course a little bit more design effort and can kind of be a bit more tricky to make the hardware. Um, but once you have done it, uh, it typically um, lets you do uh, operate it a little more, uh, a little less pain, uh, painfully. So it's kind of. But those are the two things uh, that I'm going to be uh, talking about in the experiments that I'm going to show. So, um, so this is the, the route we're going to be taking. I'm going to highlight uh, two sets of experiments now, briefly. Um, the first one being uh, basically a well, a, a quantum router is what you can call it. And so it's um, by pump by by applying pumps to the system, we're creating yeah, routable coherent interactions. Um, what do I mean by that? Also coherent. So I'm discriminating a little bit between two cases. One of them is a coherent routing, where we say like all qubits or whatever you have, cavities, other things, coupled to bus modes in a closed system, right? So we really have standing waves, if you like, in in the router. And by applying our pumps correctly, we want to enable selective pairwise interactions between any pair of those, basically. Um, the contrast to that would be, um, I'm going to talk about that afterwards, it's kind of more like an open system routing approach where we really talk about absorbing and emitting propagating photons by individual, individual modules, call like emitters, if you want. And um, they will see that we basically have no enforced relation between elements um, besides their communication frequency, which is a bit different than in this coherent routing approach. But let's start with the coherent one. So this is, uh, I should preface this, this is an experiment uh, that's currently ongoing in the, in the lab of Mike Hattridge at the University of Pittsburgh, uh, with whom I'm collaborating on this. 
Um, so this is all relatively uh, preliminary at this moment. And uh, yeah, had you been able to go to the March meeting last uh, this year, um, there might there would have been a talk um, about this already. So the idea here, conceptually speaking, is the following. So we have an element that we call the router. Um, it consists out of um, different waveguide modes in a single cavity. Um, we call this, in this case, it's four that we're considering. So they go from uh, W1 to W4. And they are all coupled by a single nonlinear element. Again, this is a three wave mixer, this uh, snail that I mentioned. And to each waveguide mode, in turn, we couple a cavity. So the cavity is the actual element um, that might contain quantum information then. So, um, but um, yeah, all of the couplings, all the nonlinearities in the system come from this snail. Um, and together with the, with the geometric way this whole thing is built, so that gives you basically the, 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 the off-resonant dispersive interaction between everything. Important design aspect is um, that all of the cavity interactions directly to each other are really extremely weak um, in, the, in, the static, uh, in the static system. And that their frequency difference, so any kind of pair that you can make, uh, that you can look at here has a distinct frequency difference, uh, which we need to drive swap interactions between them because that's kind of the way how we create selectivity in the system. So the actual implementation uh, looks something like this. That's uh, clearly <laughs> how you imagine um, a scalable quantum computer to look like. Um, so you have here, um, uh, basically, so this, this thing in the middle is the, is the waveguide cavity um, that, couples the, um, that couples then to all of these cavities. So this is, this is actually really cool from an experimental point of view because it's really truly modular. Right? So if, you, if you're unhappy with one of these elements or want to fine tune something, you clearly can swap the pieces out here. So this is really nice, um, again, from an experimental point of view. Then over here in this part of the waveguide, this is actually where, yeah, where the snail is located here. Um, and the waveguide modes um, that live in, yeah, in, this, in this part here, um, this is, these are simulations of the, uh, of the electric field, um, look something like this. So it's basically all, and the locations of all of these elements are basically just such that you can engineer these different coupling terms um, that you need um, in order to drive the interactions later. So um, let's look at some data. So this is um, really what happens then if you start applying drives to the system, right? You can see here in the hardware package, so there's variable uh, various places um, where you have coupler pins um, attached to the hardware uh, to the to the hardware, and this is exactly where you, where these where these microwave drives are being input now. Sorry, Wolfgang. And, quick question. Yes. In yeah. The previous slide. Uh, I thought usually that putting in a nonlinearity will change the shape of the modes of the cavity mm -hmm. that the nonlinearity is sitting in. Somehow the snail doesn't affect these modes. They look pretty ordinary. Well, okay. So the simulation is of course without the snail. So we're treating the, so this is a linear simulation. So this is the eigenmodes of the waveguide and the snail. So the thing is the snail, the coupling is engineered such that the, the, the snail, um, is of course a perturbation on that, but it's relatively small. That's part of the idea that you don't that it doesn't disturb the the modes without the drive all that much, right? So the actual the real nonlinear part or the real interaction part is done by the by the by the pump photons later. So it might be that in the presence of the snail, this look a little bit differently, um, but not all that much. So the key thing is the snail can help control interactions between C1 through C4, but not really have any crosstalk, cause any crosstalk. That's exactly the point, yes, that's correct. So the okay. thing is the, 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 the undriven interactions are all very, very weak in the system. Thanks. Um, so this is the typical experiment you would do here. Um, to basically start driving swaps um, between these. So we're looking at two different cavities here. 
Um, so what we have basically is, um, so we're on the x-axis, we're basically adjusting this pump tone to hit exactly the frequency difference um, between the two cavities. Right? So zero is where you would normally have expected it. Okay, it's a bit slightly off due to the older, to some higher order nonlinearities in the system. But once you hit this frequency difference, so we're looking here at the population, the cavity occupancy in two of these cavities that we're now coupling to each other. And you really see that you um, exactly on resonance, uh, you drive these swap interactions back and forth. And uh, if you change the, uh, introduce a little bit of a detuning here, um, then, you, um, then you see this typical um, yeah, chevron pattern that you, that you get by um, swapping things that are uh, slightly off resonant. <clears throat> so now we can take a cut here, um, basically exactly at zero detuning and uh, look closer at this. And what we really see is yeah, these nice back and forth oscillations between uh, what's labeled here C2 and C4. So interesting point here is like, even though the offer the undriven interactions in the system are very weak, right? So the, everything uh, is very, very well isolated if we don't drive the system. But once we start driving, we can create swap operations between these, uh, between the different cavity modes and yeah, 300 to 1200 nanoseconds, I think it was in this, uh, in, in this iteration of the experiment. So relatively fast. Um, Importantly, an interesting, uh, important point here is that, the, okay, I'm calling it fidelity in quotation marks here, because in this case, this is all done with Gaussian states and there's no real quantum state tomography or anything like that down here. <clears throat> but the decay that you see here, uh, the, that you get, that you would expect from the, just from the intrinsic cavity lifetimes uh, matches very well the decay in these, in these swap curves. Or in other words, it looks like that any of the imperfections here are basically limited only by the intrinsic decay of the cavities at this moment, which is very promising, of course, if you want to uh, go move on from this proof of concept and really employ this in a, in a, in a useful system. Now you can also see that this really acts as a router by um, um, by driving things simultaneously. So you're not limited to only one pairwise interaction at a time. You just drive, um, you can just apply drives basically of two different frequencies at the same time. And you can, for instance, look at uh, swaps between these two cavities and these two cavities um, happening more or less at the same time. <clears throat> now you can do also some, some slightly more funky things in here that all comes basically built in. You drive this frequency difference and this frequency difference here at the same time. Right? And you start with photons only in this one, and you see like this that you kind of like equally distribute um, photons between the blue and the dark green one here at the bottom. Now, if we had started, for example, with a single photon here um, in this cavity, then at this point, of course, you would make a you would make a dull state. So you could like use this this router, of course, so immediately for um, uh, um, yeah for entanglement distribution and things like that. In, in, in these kind of modular systems. So this seems to work really, uh, really, really well so far. As I said, this is ongoing, this is ongoing work. In particular, the guys there are working on, um, as far as I know, on like introducing quantum states and things like that uh, into this to make this like an actual, yeah, an actual quantum router instead of just a Gaussian state router that I've shown here so far. So uh, you might be worried um, now moving forward. Uh, as I said, that this is relatively large. This is like mm, a, a solid, mm, a solid two fist sized large experiment in this case. Um, of course, you might be worried of like, how do we move on from this and can you reduce the footprint? And some, some people have already looked into that in similar experiments. Uh, so if you wanna make that actually say scalable so you can, for instance, uh, one step further would be to make this bus mode, so not this big waveguide, but you can make smaller elements. And so one example is from Yale, um, where they basically just use the superconducting cable. So this, then, then everything gets already a little bit smaller. Uh, the different cavity systems here, in this case, there were actually also qubits um, involved. They're still relatively large, but everything is already much more compact. <clears throat> And has very yeah very similar results in, uh, in this experiment, except that it's only two modules coupled to each other. 
Um, but of course, if you want to go then like yeah, really, um, really scalable, really compact, and then there's of course ideas out there, but they haven't been integrated with these kind of things. You know, this is again like something uh, we thought of uh, while I was at Yale. Um, the vision you could, for instance, think of making all of these modules like waveguides, cavities, and all connected in the right way, for instance, by machining this or yeah, by etching, chemically etching it basically all into, into silicon wafers and um, pressure bonding everything together. So this is ongoing work still at Yale to integrate all of these elements there. But there are some, some credible technical routes um, yeah, to, to, to move these proof of concept experiments into something that's actually you know, technically um, has technically a, a prospect for making larger scale systems out of it. So <clears throat> that said, um, of course, this, um, this approach has some somewhat obvious um, practical limits if we really think about it. So one of them is of course, like um, they're all somewhat engineering, ch engineering challenges, if you like. So one of them is of course that uh, to engineering the couplings, right? Like if you make the system bigger and bigger and the, the engineering the right coupling strengths uh, with the multitude of modes that you start now having in this becomes a little bit more difficult. So we would have to deal with that. Um, then of course, what I've shown you is like all based on coherent hybridization. So everything needs to be reasonably high Q in this system. And this is of course uh, a limit to what I said earlier, what, I, what we really want, like this modularity. So it's of course like the easier you wanna have something like detached and reattached to the system, uh, the less likely it is that you can make it with really high quality factors and really good hybridization between the systems. And um, yeah, finally, this is maybe the, 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 the most difficult one, in my opinion, um, is you have to think of when you add more and more systems to each other, you have to worry about like how can you address individual connections that you want to make in the system, right? So each interaction that we've seen corresponds to a unique frequency difference between different modes, right? So you have to be smart about how to spread out your frequencies uh, in order to always have the ones that you want um, be resolvable, right? So if you if you have a, a pump tone that bridges this frequency, for example, you have to make sure that it doesn't do anything anything funky with all of the other modes. So this is something. These are some things to worry about um, or to think about um, when we want to move on with these kind of systems. It raises, of course, also naturally the question of like, uh, well, can we be even more flexible? Like, can you can you can you relax some of these constraints um, by sacrificing some of the benefits, maybe, um, to move on? And this is what I'm going to talk about next. Uh, like, how do we do communication maybe with propagating photons? Because there we don't have to worry about all of these things, but it comes at a price. So the idea is, of course, very much um, inspired um, by what has happened in, uh, in AMO over the years. Right? So we're really thinking about cavity QED systems that emit and absorb photons and you route these photons around in some way um, to um, entangle them or perform gate operations or what have you, right? And the interesting thing about this is, as I said, that these different modules now, they don't really, this, except for that they have to, to have to send photons at the right frequency to each other. Um, there's little relation that they have to each other. So you don't really have to know anything about the other ones to do this. Of course, the obvious challenge in this is it looks immediately at first glance, it's clear that this is going to be much more lossy than what you can do for coherent interactions. Um, the good news, however, is that it's not as bad as it might appear, right? So there is, it has been re relatively early recognized in some of these initial proposals already that uh, the, the, uh, the, the error thresholds of what we can tolerate in order to say we can build bigger and bigger systems are not as bad as they seem. So um, some of these analyses, for instance, this one here have, um, um, have predicted that you can tolerate like double digit errors, uh, double digit percentage errors in these connection links between the individual modules, as long as like what you have in an in individual of these kind of like yeah, network nodes, if you like, as long as you can operate those really, really well. And so on that, that gives relative, relatively forgiving thresholds. And there's some other tricks uh, that you can play that I'm gonna uh, mention at, uh, in a bit. So 
Let's see. So what approaches do we have for linking nodes? Okay, the, the most obvious one, because it's known since a long time, is maybe uh, to use uh, make use of probabilistic entanglement by measurement. So it's been a focus in the in the AMO community for a long time now. Um, so basically, the idea here is what you can do um, is to emit photons from individual um, cavity QED modules or other other atomic-like systems. Uh, interfere these emitted photons and then uh, and then measure them. So this is basically erasing the which path information and then by tracing out the over the photons, you can create entanglement between the different modules. So this can be done um, uh, faster than the decoherence time um, of the individual modules by now, and this is uh, this is kind of gives some credibility to the to the idea of um, really generating relatively uh, low error interactions between. Uh, remote systems. Um, and similar things have also been done with transmons in the in the recent years. Uh, these are some of the examples that follow exactly basically this idea uh, by trace it by erasing the which path information, measuring the propagating photons, and then ending up with an entangled state. Um, however, there is one key difference between superconducting systems and AMO, of course, um, and that is that the losses with which we can propagate photons um, is, can potentially be much, much lower. Right. So, and that gives um, that lets us explore alternative options that are maybe a bit out of reach for a lot of um, um, systems in the optical. And this is, uh, for instance, um, deterministic state transfer and entanglement. So where you would really say you control the spontaneous emission or the stimulated or spontaneous emission and absorption of a uh, of an individual cavity QED like system. So you try to release these photons in form of a of a controlled wave packet. But if you have control over the emission, that means you have also control over the absorption, and then you might uh, be able to just capture the wave packet somewhere else again. Right. So and as long and what you need for that is basically tunable coupling between some sort of memory um, element. In this case, this would be this red cavity here, and some sort of communication element. It would be the blue one here. And this was originally shown in this uh, work by C. Rock et al. But so this can be really done with a vanishingly small error, basically, if you have good control over this. And because this part here, the, the lossless transmission between the two elements is something that is, uh, works pretty well in superconducting circuits. So this is a promising route. So this is work uh, we've done at Yale a few years ago. I quickly want to go over. So our version of a tunable cavity QED system looks basically like this. Um, so we have a, a memory element as a high Q cavity, a, a communication element as a low Q cavity, they couple both to a transmon. In this case, it acts as a four wave mixer, as I mentioned earlier. So the qubit element is not actually very important in this part of the experiment. Um, and we introduce by pumping and this tunable coupling between them. So it's basically a swap interaction between the two. Um, but because this one here couples to the, to the, to the outside world, uh, then the wave packet kind of leaks out here. And that is what enables us to make shaped photons that contain some quantum information. Um, now, what we what you can do relatively um, straightforwardly is by solving the equations of motion here. You can basically show that by tailoring the the pulses here that you send in here of the pump of the pump photons, I can make any kind of um, any kind of um, wave packet shape, as you can see here. And this can be done um, uh, relatively quickly. So we've been able to evacuate to, to to get the photons out of about three orders of magnitude faster than this time on which it would intrinsically decay. And it can be relatively efficient because this is all based on dispersive interactions originally and in with superconducting circuits and those are intrinsically lossless. Um, so then you can, with this in mind, so you can assemble the full experiment. That's what we've done about a couple, uh, two, three years ago um, in the first iteration. So uh, what you can basically hook two of these systems up to each other. Uh, important element here is the circulator element. This really breaks the symmetry and uh, it makes this actually like um, uh, propagation of propagating photons through this transmission line rather than what I've shown earlier where you have interacting between standing waves. There's no standing waves involved that hybridize these two systems. So they're really independent. Um, 
And then what you can do, uh, you can, as I said, uh, deterministically transfer quantum states between these uh, between these two systems. So this would be photonic states encoded in the Fock basis, so zero plus one kind of states. And uh, you can take do quantum state tomography on what you've prepared and what you have received on the other side and what you can figure out uh, if you do this for a full uh, set of states uh, that you can do this with an average fidelity of uh, just shy of something like 90% or so. <clears throat> Uh, you can also uh, generate entanglement. It's the same idea, except that you start, uh, that you fully transmit a quantum state. You kind of half transfer a quantum state, if you like. So if you start with a single photon on one side and half of it gets transferred to the other side, then you naturally end up with a Bell state. So you can analyze some joint state tomography here. And again, with okay-ish fidelities for a proof of concept, in this case, almost 80%. So now, of course, if we want to think of uh, quantum processors and um, doing something interesting with that, these fidelities aren't exactly um, what, what you need to do uh, or what you need to meet in, in order to do something. Um, but it's, in, it's nevertheless already pretty promising. So we were actually pretty excited when we see these numbers um, because it already almost at the level where you can think about improving things with error correction. So what you can see here right, is that we basically you can uh, prepare or send and receive um, logical uh, yeah, code words of, a, of, a, of, an, of an error correction code. Um, and they get transmitted with high enough fidelity that you're almost at the break even point of where you would win. Right? So, okay, so in the red line, you see here, this is uh, the fidelity, the average uh, infidelity as a function of transfer efficiency. Um, that you can get by just sending zeros and ones, basically. Um, but with this, uh, in this, in this, uh, in this case, we use the binomial code. If you use this binomial code and apply correction, you're almost reaching the same efficiency again, uh, the same fidelities again after decoding. So the interesting part here is that it doesn't, it wouldn't take much more um, in order to go to a regime where we can already uh, perform error corrected um, communication between these kind of systems. So I should mention uh, one of the experiments that I've shown earlier has actually implemented that with error detection now. So it's all the correction was done in software, but in this case, they, um, they went back to a coherent transfer scheme. So we're actually the, um, the communication between the two modules is still through a cable, but it's still a form of coherent hybridization, if you like. Okay, uh, yes. no big deal that you didn't rotate the received logical one state, right? Um, no, I think um, Meng Cheng, the student who <laughs> wrote the decoder in this case, um, and that's all done in the software decoding. Okay. So that's taken care of, but it's a deterministic rotation. Yeah. This is as measured, I would say, um, okay. in the decoding. So when you go back to the qubit fidelity, basically, uh, by applying the decoding, this is taken into account, of course. Okay. So yeah. this is a trivial Z rotation. Yeah, so indeed, not a big deal. Um, so yeah, all in all, um, the status of these experiments currently is like, it's really not too far away from where, so I find it very encouraging, where thresholds uh, for quantum error correction become relevant. And maybe interestingly, it's at this moment, it's not actual, I would say it's not actual loss anywhere in the system that dominates um, these technical imperfections, that dominates um, the performance at this moment. There's a lot of other, say, technical imperfections that can actually be overcome without thinking about, let's say, like really hard boundaries there. So there's impedance mismatches and things like using imperfect elements for some of these things. Um, that give us hope that this should, with some reasonably doable improvements, actually become much better and then might be a credible route for building larger scale systems with acceptable fidelities. So um, in the last few minutes, um, what I want to focus on, though, is um, talk about a little bit of, well, talk about like what can we do beyond making like these two node networks, right? Can we make these networks larger or more interesting in some way? Um, like as an aside, something that some people have already worked really hard on making these things uh, larger and or more interesting. Um, I want to show two examples. <laughs> One is a great example of definitely larger. Uh, this is a, a really cool uh, experiment by the group of Andreas Warov in Zurich. 
uh, that came out earlier this year. So where they've done exactly that experiment that us and also them had done before, um, but now between two different dilution refrigerators. So what they've basically done is here, so here have one transmon cavity system sitting on this side and one over here. And they basically built a <laughs> 20 millikelvin link between the refrigerators. So um, yeah, this tube that gets like welded between. And there's a superconducting cable basically that goes all the way through here. So this is one, you know, when I think about modular to the extreme or eventually filling a whole room uh, with your quantum computer, this is a, a really cool way to go. Um, and um, what you can, of course, also do, this was uh, work that was done in the group of Conrad Leonard uh, a few years ago um, in Boulder. I can also think of building interesting heterogeneous networks. So in this case, they emitted photons from a transmon system um, in exactly the way I described. Um, and those were then sent to a mechanical system that captured it. So you basically convert the, the quantum information that was originally in the in the in the qubit now into quantum information in a mechanical oscillator. So definitely a much more interesting network. And uh, the appeal of that is that you could, for instance, use this mechanical oscillator when you can do these kind of things, for instance, to transduce up to optical frequencies, if you like. So this might be one way of how you can, can network um, very different kinds of things together. Um, all right, I have two more slides on kind of like some other way of how you could make this thing more, well, larger and more interesting. And this is by engineering non-reciprocal couplings. So this is in the last year or so, a bunch of really interesting proposals have emerged and I wanna um, quickly highlight one of them that I find very appealing. That is from uh, the Nakamura group. Um, and here the idea is basically to make uh, engineer arbitrary connectivity uh, all through a 1D chain. So you basically, the in essential ingredient is if you can, uh, we're able to hook up, build emitters that can chirally couple to your transmission line, basically by saying, um, you can control the decay and the absorption yeah, direction. So you could say like, okay, you build a module, in this case, it's a logical module composed out of two transmon qubits that they proposed here. And using interference between the emission, um, you're, you might be able um, to kind of have the wave packet propagate only in one direction. So the key ingredient here is again, this is why this is relevant for what I'm talking about, is, a, is again a controllable conversion process between the qubit and a, a qubit and a, and a, yeah, a communication element, a resonator. Um, and this can of course be done with the mixing techniques that I, uh, that I described. And so on, if you can do this on both of these elements, then you can basically create one module consisting out of these two qubits that can store logical quantum information, if you like, and can communicate um, directionally along this transmission line. And if you hook up more to them, more of them to this kind of line and can control each of them individually, that would allow you to engineer any kind of interaction between any of them. So this is kind of the, um, this is kind of a, a really interesting way forward. And there's two more works uh, um, that have been shown. One of them is a proposal from Innsbruck and the other one is experimental work from Lincoln Labs where they showed something that goes in a similar direction. Um, and finally, um, just to finish this off, um, you can, of course, now also think of other inter interesting things and an interesting prospect that I'm that I think we could have. And once you have these chiral couplings of um, of individual emitters, if you like, to transmission lines, can think of um, um, studying the impact of noise. Now, what's been shown, for instance, a few years ago uh, by two groups independently, is that if you have this chiral coupling and you have these emitters that can absorb and emit unidirectionally that uh, you get uh, specific kinds of noise resilience in the system, in particular um, common, um, a common noise in the waveguide. So a proposal that you can uh, have them, for instance, is it might be possible to have this waveguide that connects all of them like at a much higher temperature than the nodes themselves. So I think the second one proposed actually uh, to do this, <laughs> to build intracity networks uh, that operate at four Kelvin, uh, because the noise in the waveguide here basically um, doesn't matter at all anymore if you can engineer um, these couplings correctly. 
Now you can take this even further by, um, by thinking of what happens when you drive this system and you realize that what actually what can happen is that, uh, uh, that due to the interference of the emitted photons and the drive, um, that you, that you generate interesting sets of dark states in, in chains like this. And uh, that would enable you to explore ideas of uh, autonomous um, quantum state stabilization, stabilization of entangled states, or yeah, if you push this even further, um, you could go towards autonomous quantum error correction. So yeah, all in all, um, yeah, this might be a, yeah, engineering these kind of couplings, especially when they're like programmable and situ tunable with strong drives. This might be an interesting way of um, yeah, studying quantum dynamics in open systems, explore bath engineering. And of course, the hope in the long run would be that this can also guide us by understanding the role of noise and what can be done in the presence of noise uh, might guide us towards building uh, better, larger quantum processors that make use of these connection schemes. And with that, oh, um, yeah, I wanted to summarize, but apparently someone forgot to actually type out the summary. I apologize for that. Um, I'm gonna instead as a summary, okay, I'm gonna flash the the uh, the intro slide again. So okay, what I've told talked to a little bit about just to summarize in one sentence. It's like that we can create interesting interactions that are normally off by um, by strong driving. And that gives us a bunch of new interesting ways to go, in particular routing of interactions and um, potentially also routing in open systems where you can really have completely flexible and on-demand interaction between things that are relatively far away from each other. And I think that's it. Thanks for your attention. Thanks for sticking around. Let's, uh, let's all clap as best we can. Thank Wolfgang. All right, I'm going to